started. Um, so I've got a lot of stuff here on the board today, um, but uh, <coughs> nothing that's on the board should be uh, anything that's new because it's all just a regurgitation of what we did on um, on Friday. So there's that. Um, let's talk about logistics today. May be our last lecture in concrete design. I mean, we're going to meet Friday. We're going to meet Friday regardless for um, uh, for you all to turn in homework nine and have a Q and A session on the uh, uh, on the exam. But uh, today, my goal is to try and get through as much um, material today as possible, um, so that we can sort of uh, you know expedite this process. Um, so let me go through a couple things. So first off, homework eight is currently being graded. My goal is to get you homework eight back on Wednesday. Um, other than that, everything's graded in return. The solution to homework eight is online now. So you all have that solution. And then for homework nine, the, the moment that you turn it in, you'll get the solution. So that way, for the exam, you'll have solutions to every homework assignment ready to go into the exam. Um, couple more announcements. First off, course evals. I've already got a, a significant majority of you that have already done it. I'm still waiting on four of you to complete the course evals, but I'm waiting on five of you to upload it. Somebody did the course eval, but they didn't upload the picture that uh, said that they did it. Free, free homework points, so just keep that in mind. Uh, sound good? Last uh, uh, announcement is really more of a request. So every year, Marshall hosts the West Virginia Bridge Design and Build Competition. Uh, it's a pretty big event. Um, we're going to have a bunch of middle schoolers and high schoolers here on campus on Saturday. Um, they're going to be doing some balsa wood testing, like they have these balsa bridges that they're going to test until failure. Uh, and, and it's a big competition. It's a big to-do. Uh, it's on Saturday. To be honest, I could use some help. So if there's anybody that's here on Saturday uh, and wouldn't mind coming by and helping out for a bit, um, we have food. Uh, we'll, we'll feed you and all that. Yes? What hours is that? Uh, it, it's an all-day event, but um, honestly, like, like we, can, if you're interested, like we can talk after class. But I mean, I'll use you. Like, whenever you're here, I'll, I'll use you. So, um, but we'll talk about it, um, uh, like after class. But if you're interested, I, I really could use your help. I really would appreciate it. Sound good? All right. So let's talk about uh, this last uh, column design example, and then we're going to get into bean columns. So what I have drawn here on the board um, is. First off, let's sort of like go back to the example, and uh, you know, for those of you catching this on YouTube, there's nothing on here that it hasn't already been discussed on YouTube, anyways. So we have a, a column that we were designing. So let's just sort of back up a little bit further. So we're in the world of columns. We've done two column analysis problems, and as for column design, we designed our square tied column, and now we're working on designing a circular column. So. Uh, circular spirally reinforced column. So let's see where we left off. So we had a column that has a 240 kip dead load, a 300 kip live load. So we factored that and we got 768, right? Now it's a circular, or it's a spirally reinforced column. So we know our V value and our alpha value. That was pretty straightforward. And then we computed two quantities for the purposes of design. We computed a required gross area. And so that came out to be 265.8 square inches, and then we solved for the diameter. We got a diameter of 18.4 inches. But what we ended up doing is we actually rounded that down to 18 inches so that we could use that area to compute AST, which is fine as long as you're not taking this and multiplying it by 2%, or taking this and multiplying it by 2%, that you're actually using the actual gross area to solve for uh, your AST. So we have a, uh, a column that's 18 inches in diameter, so its area is 254.5 square inches. So I have that drawn over here on this board, so it's just an 18 inch diameter column. Now one thing I, I don't think that we did last time, but it's pretty simple. We've been using a uh, one and a half inch cover this whole time. So if it's an 18 inch diameter column, then the core diameter is just that minus two covers, right? So that minus 2 times 1 and a half is 15 inches. And if the area of an 18 inch diameter circle is this, the area of a 15 inch diameter circle is 176.7, just pi over 4d squared. It's just a new diameter. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? 
So if we're looking over here on the right, if I have the column and I'm using one and a half inch cover, here's the column, an inch and a half, an inch and a half, and so that diameter is 15 inches. Is everybody okay with that? Again, nothing here that we didn't calculate last time. Uh, last thing, so we plug and chuck for our area of steel requirement. We got like 5.997 is real close to 6. So I say we just use 6 number 9s. So that's an area of 6 square inches. So right now, here's what our column looks like. It's an 18 inch diameter column, uh, one and a half inch cover. This, this right here, that's our spiral. And we don't really know what's going on with that yet. That's the one thing that's left. But we know that these bars are six number nines. Now, is it okay that we use six bars? Is that okay? Let's, let's get, back, get everybody back into the swing of things with, with column. If you, let's pop quiz. If you're using a tied column, a square tied column, what's the minimum amount of bars that you can use? Everybody remember? Four. Four. And if it's a circular, spirally reinforced column, what's the minimum number of bars that you can use? It's in the notes. It's six, right? Y'all remember that? Here, I'll go up a little bit. So spiral columns. Oh, here, let me go back. So here we go. So ACI requirements for cast in place columns. We know our reinforcement ratio has to be between 0.01 and 0.08. We're going to check that for, uh, here in a second. Four longitudinal bars for a um, tied column, six longitudinal bars for a spiral column. So we've got that uh, taken care of. A practical minimum column dimension is uh, anywhere between eight and 10 inches. We're good there. And so we're going to check those as well as our spiral check here in a second. So let's do those real quick. So, let's do uh, ACI checks. So, the number of longitudinal bars is 6, and that's okay because it's greater than or equal to 6, right? There's a minimum of 6. And then, what's our row G? Well, it's the area of steel divided by the gross area of the column. So the, we're using actual numbers here, not AG min. Okay? So actual numbers here. Okay, so this is 6.00 inches squared, and this is 254.5. So what does that come out to be? While you all are doing that, I'm going to write something here on the board. What was this going to have to be? <clears throat> 0 0.024. 0 0.024. Is that good? And why? There we go. So it's between point zero one and point zero eight. Now, one thing to keep in mind. Remember when we were in design mode, we assumed a value of 0 0.02. Now look what happened. Here's the column size that we calculated, but we went with a smaller column. So the column is smaller than what we calculated, so as a result, our actual reinforcement ratio went up. It's like the column got smaller, so the amount of steel had to get larger. But it's still within 0 0.01 to 0 0.08, so we're still, of course, uh, uh, well within the realm of uh, what's allowed. Okay. The last thing that we have to deal with is this uh, spiral. So let's look at the spiral reinforcement. So, first off, let me go back here. Let's jog everybody's memory. 
So here we're in the notes, and we're going to go past the tide column, tide column, spiral column. Okay. All right. So spirals may not have diameters less than three-eighths of an inch, so number three bars or larger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a number three bar, okay? I'm going to use the smallest reinforcement as possible. So for this spiral, I'm going to say it's a number three at some spacing. Now, how far is that spacing? Well, remember, okay, here's the longitudinal bars going up the column, and the spiral goes like that, right? And so what we're after is we're trying to figure out that distance, you know, how, how far apart those spirals uh, are, are pitched. Now, we know the size of this bar is a number three, but we don't know this dimension. That's what we're going to figure out, okay? So, is everybody with me on what we're trying to figure out? Okay. So, we're going to try a number three spiral. So, let's see if anybody remembers this. What's the diameter of a number three? And what's the, uh, the area of a number three? Three eighths inches in diameter. What's the area of a number three? Point one one. Okay, so that's the area and that's the diameter. So, in order to determine this, this is pretty straightforward. So, we need our minimum reinforcement ratio, which comes from ACI. What is that? Is that 254? Is that right? What's H A C? I can't see it. 176.7. Alright, does everybody see what I'm doing? So I'm just plugging and checking in here. And this this is the ACI requirement. This is telling me how much steel I have to provide in order to be able to consider this a spirally reinforced column. And so what does that come out to be? Yes? So this is coming off the whole question. So in a tied column versus a spirally reinforced column, so on a tie, the rebar is bars are all held at the same position vertically. Mm -hmm. In the spiral, it kind of like would go up around it. Does that affect the bending of the rebar in the column? What? Like, I'm trying to fix the trying to So like, like I said, in the tide column, all the rebar is held at the same position. Yeah, you have bam, 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 bam. It's in the, the, kind of in the spiral, like, does, it, does it kind of go up in the so they're not held at the same position? Yes. It's like a big spring going up, up the column. So does that, does that affect how the bar moves or how it bends? Because it's not held at the same position. I don't understand what you mean by bend. Like we're taking the column going. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know if it, if it, whenever it was compressed, if it, those gaps on the like, very, they were. Um, I'm going to be honest. I really don't understand yeah, what you're asking. I'll come up. Okay. Like think about it. Like let's let's keep going. You can. I, I don't really get what you're asking. Yeah. All right. Everybody else? Like I, I don't understand. Am I missing something? Are you just saying if it fails, will it fail differently than the tide column? Basically. Well, remember the the spirally reinforced column serves to confine that core a little bit. So it acts. Remember the syringe uh, yeah. analogy that if you push your finger on the syringe, that it sort of holds it in. That's what this spiral reinforcement is doing. It's got to go up around the column. Now you're going to tie this these longitudinal bars to the spiral as it goes up, but I don't really know what you're asking. Yeah, that was kind of what I was saying. How would they build it? Basically? Well, that that would be my answer. Yeah. That, that it just it, the the 
core of that column remains confined. Like the concrete stalls first, but that core can hold a little bit more before it crushes. Does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that? All right. What are we getting here? 0.013. Say again? 0.013. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. This is the minimum amount of reinforcement that we're allowed to provide. This is how we compute how much we're actually providing. Now, does everybody remember this formula? It's for, uh, hold on, AS DC minus DB over S DC squared. Does everybody remember this? Now, what don't we know? Say again? We don't know the spacing. So why don't we take this, multiply and divide and solve. So in other words, here's what I'm going to do. This is the minimum. This is how much we would actually provide. Well, if I plug this value in, it'll tell me what spacing I need in order to meet this requirement. Does that make sense? So in other words, I can rewrite this as S min. Or sorry, actually, no, 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 let me, let me rewrite that. Hold on, hold on, hold Let, Let's leave that subscript off for now. Is 4 AS DC minus DB over rho minimum DC squared. Let, let's just chug this out. Let's see what happens. So, What's that? Is that not really? Well, I'm, well, we don't know what row actual is. See, that, that's the whole point. See, what it, what I'm at, let me ask you, what is row actual? Tell me what we what what we don't know. So that's the thing. We can't calculate row actual because we don't know what that is. So we're going to solve for what this is by plugging in that. Does that make sense? What's the difference between that and row gene? The, okay, that's a good question. This row corresponds to the longitudinal bars. This corresponds to the spiral bars. Everybody okay with that? I mean, if you're, I mean, um, if you're not, let me know. Okay, all right. 0 0.11 inches squared, 15 inches minus. Now, D sub B, that's the bar diameter. That's, um, or sorry, sorry, that's, sorry. Uh, that's, that's a typo. That's D sub S. D sub S. So this is 3 eighths. And this is 0 0.013 times 15 inches squared. What does that come out to be? 2.2. Like a little bit more. It's like 2.17. Is that what you got? Okay, well, we'll look, you know, 2.2 is fine. Actually, let's leave it at 2.2. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. Now, I left this subscript off because I want to ask a question. Okay. That S corresponds to how far apart those spirals need to be. Okay? In other words, what we're talking about is this right here. We're saying S equals what? Now we calculated a value of 2.2 inches. Now typically I'm not going to specify something like 2.2 inches to the contractor. I'm going to specify something like maybe to the nearest half inch, maybe to the nearest inch, something like that. So if the value is 2.2 inches, what are you going to tell the contractor? two inches, right? You're going to round down. Does that make sense? In other words, what we've computed right here is not an S min, but an S max. Does that make sense? So in other words, this spiral, we'll say it's number three at two inches, and you want an answer to this problem, Here's your answer, right here. 
That's your answer. What do you think? So on an examiner, you always want to want to see a sketch like that. Yeah. Yes, I am. Now, keep in mind, we got two hours on the exam. We don't have one. And I'm not making the exam any longer. So. This exam is, I, I, I don't do like super long exams, like finals. It's, it's the same way. So. What? This one going to be like somewhere to steal. <laughs> I actually think we've already had our hardest exam in here. I think the hardest exam in here is the second one. Do we need compass to draw a purpose? No, we need compass to draw a purpose. How will we take the circle already? What's that? How will we take the circle already? Without a compass. A template? I don't know. Bring a quarter? I, I, All right, does anybody have any questions on this? This is important. Yes? Is it typical to always like go for the number three spiral and then get the maximum spacing for it rather than trying a different one with different spacing? Yeah, yeah. Typ typically, a, a number three spiral is very, very common. First off, they're, they're kind of easy to bend. You know, it's a, a smaller rebar. And it's it's just arguably the most common. I mean, the, the, the spec says you can't go with anything number three and smaller, so most designers just interpret that as well. go with the number three. You know? As for the spacing, the spacing is limited between one and three inches anyways. So if you compute an S value that's like seven inches, just go with three. You know? Or, you know so. And let me say this. If you compute a spacing that's like half an inch or something, then the way to get around that is to use a larger spiral. Does that make sense? Any questions? So for the row actual, that's that's the form of what we use any time for the row actual for the spiral. Well that well I mean I guess yeah that that's the actual reinforcement in the column. This is how much you have to provide. Oh, I'm right. so, does that make sense? Well, I was looking through the notes and it said the percentage for that formula. What? I'm not getting the percentage. Percentage of spiral steel? Well, that's what a row value is. That, that's, I mean, that's what a row value is. I mean, it, when you calculate it, you get like a 0 .013. So for the spiral it's re re reinforcement, it's 1.3% steel, yes. Because that's, I mean, what is it? It's a volume of steel divided by a volume of concrete. That's, that's what it is. So. Any questions? All right, okay. We got our last topic, and I'm going to try and get through it as much as I can, but um, we might have to come in on Wednesday because... Uh, Y'all had a lot of good questions, and I don't want to rush this. Okay. Let's talk about interaction. Okay, so how many of you do not have this, what I've given you? How many of you all don't have this? Okay. All right. I want y'all to pay attention to this, because this is kind of important. Uh, well, hold on. Okay. So look at this. I want to talk about interaction equations. And for those of you that are in steel design, we've already dealt with interaction equations before in there. Remember bolt interaction? Remember we had bolts that had shear and tension on them? So how did we handle a, uh, an interaction problem? We would like for bolts. We would say, okay, here's the shear capacity of the bolt. Here's the tensile capacity of the bolt. But here's this interaction that we have to compute. Remember, the way that we handled it in steel design for bolt groups is we said, let's compute a modified tensile capacity that's a function of how much shear stress is on the thing. Y'all remember that? And so if you had a bunch of shear stress, the tensile capacity went down. Right? Well, we're going to do something a little different in here, and we're going to look at uh, columns that are being pressed on and bent at the same time, which is very, very common when you have an element uh, 
uh, in a building, like a column, where the building is subjected to wind. Because the column has to hold the building up, so it's seeing the gravity load, but it's also being pushed left to right. Okay? So whether it's wind or seismic, very, very common. Okay. Let's look at some interaction formulas. Now, I'm going to keep this real simple. All right? Would you all agree with this first statement here, that the design resistance has to be greater than or equal to design loads? Okay. If I divide it, divide both sides by this, would you agree that PU divided by PPN has to be uh, less than or equal to 1? That would be a fair statement. That's an interaction equation right there. Very, very basic. Um, well, actually, I lie. It's part of an interaction equation. In other words, this would be a limit that we must meet for axial load. We could do the same thing for bending. So a simplified interaction relationship would be, you know, the load divided by the resistance for the axial plus the load divided by the resistance for the moment, that that sum has to be less than or equal to 1. And this would be a simplified interaction relationship. If we wanted to keep it super, super simple, I could give you a column uh, with some load and some moment on it. And I think you all can do this really, really easily, and, and that would be good. The, the problem is, is that this is wildly, wildly conservative. Okay? Very conservative. So much so that it is prohibitively conservative. So, um, I don't really have a good way of, you know, explaining that it's conservative without going through an example. But the only thing that I can uh, uh, simply state is this. When you have a column that's being loaded in compression, all it's seeing is compression. Say what you will about that, but concrete is a material that behaves very, very well in compression, very poorly in tension, right? Okay? You've heard me mention pre-stressed concrete before, right? Well, here's the deal with pre-stressed concrete. If you have a beam that's under bending, part of it's seen compression and part of it's seen tension. So we put reinforcement in the area where there's tension. That's reinforced concrete design in a nutshell. But if I have a way of locking in some amount of compression, I can actually improve the design. Okay? That's the whole fun, uh, foundation of pre-stressed concrete. We can lock in a force inside that beam. We can make the beam a lot smaller. Okay? And the way I want to describe that to you is through beam columns. So let's do a very, very basic example. Okay? I want to look at this, this uh, column right here. It's uh, 18 inches wide, 18 inches tall, and it's got four bars in it. So each bar has an area of one square inch. This is a number nine, this is number nine, this is number nine, this is number nine. Okay? And this distance all around is three inches. Okay, so if you want some notation, D would be 15 inches, D prime would be 3 inches. Everybody okay with that? Now, let's develop some points. Do I have this? Do I have this? Okay, let me erase this. Let's develop some points. And, and ultimately what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and do a plot. Okay, there's a name for this plot, and it's called a, a, a PM curve, or an interaction curve. Okay, so here's the deal with a PN curve, okay? Typically what we do is we put the bending moment on this axis and we put the axial load on this axis and we plot it out, okay? Now we'll come up with some points on this curve. Let's see if we can, we can hash this out. So let's start off with a really, really simple case. Let's start off with a case of pure axial load. So M's on the x-axis, P's on the y-axis. So it's zero comma something. As for what that something is, well, if I have a column, what is its theoretical capacity under axial load? It's 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete plus FY times the area of the steel. So would you agree with me that if I plug and chug, I'm going to get a value that's something like 1328. Would you agree with that? So one point on this curve is going to be 0, 1328. So maybe right there. Fair statement? Okay. Now the next point on that curve uh, is going to be uh, the flip side. What happens when you have nothing uh, or no axial load? What's the bending moment? Now, one thing before I move on, remember that whole 
point eight for accidental eccentricity. I'm going to ignore that for now. Multiply it later, but, but for now I'm going to ignore it. Okay, now let's look at the case of pure bending. Now, if this is pure bending and I'm bending about this axis, isn't that a doubly reinforced beam? Right, there's, ten, there's steel on the bottom and there's steel up top. So remember this equation, how we would determine where the neutral axis is for a doubly reinforced beam, right? Then we would figure out where C is, so we plug and chug. You all have this. I'm not making you write this down. All these notes are on Blackboard, and I'm not going to make you plug and chug it. But here's this expression for the quadratic term. Here's the linear term. Here's the constant. Rewrite it. You get this. So you can plug and chug and get a C of 2.691. Uh, there's the C, here's the moment capacity, and we end up getting something like 141.65. You all can follow the math. I'm not making you do the math, but do you kind of see where I'm coming from? Everybody get this? Okay. So this is 141.65 and 0. Okay. That doesn't tell us everywhere in between. Okay. The only thing I will say is that if we were using a really, really basic moment interaction curve or beam column interaction curve like this one, our plot would look like that. This dashed line right here, that's the plot of that curve. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, I mean just plug and chug and, and, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, I have this point, this is pure axial, this is pure bending. How do I get any point in between? Well, there's a really easy way of doing it, and a really easy way of doing it is just to sort of guess a C value, and then what we do is we guess a C value. Based on that C value, we determine, okay, what are the strains in the steel, what are the stresses in the steel, what are the forces in the steel and the concrete, and use equilibrium to get everything else. And what do I mean by guess a C value? This is sort of where like something like Microsoft Excel comes into play. We pick a C value, do some calcs, and then pick another C value, do some calcs. And we just keep doing this over and over again and plot. I mean, that, that's what Excel is all about. So just to give you an example, I'm just going to make up a value. Uh, let's just assume C is 11 inches. Let's just make that up. Let's just say C is 11 inches. Well, if C is 11 inches, would you agree that I could compute the strain in the steel? 0.003 D minus C over C for the tensile steel. 0.003 C minus D prime over C for the compressive steel. And so there's the strain. So if I've got the strains, I can look at this, and I see that the compressive steel has yielded. That hasn't, right? So if that's the case, then the compressive steel is yielded, its stress is 60. The tensile steel hasn't yielded, so its stress is E times the strain, right? But if I've got that, then I know that the force in the concrete is 0.85 FC prime AB. The force in this steel is stress times area. The force in this layer of steel is stress times the area. Everybody with me on that? So then what I can do is I can say, all right, Sum of forces tells me that if I just sum all these up, take the compression as positive, the tension is negative, there's my axial load. Because think, if I have some amount of compressive force and some amount of tensile force, and sum of forces has to be zero, well, if I sum these up, obviously sum of forces and compression doesn't equal sum of forces and tension, so it doesn't equal zero. And the reason why is because this is a beam column. There is a load. There is a compressive load. What is that compressive load? Well, it's what makes up for equilibrium. So, sum of forces in the y direction tells me that P is 628.95, and sum of moments, this is just summing moments about the centroid, tells me that's my bending moment. So that's another point. So this would be you know, 297.87, this would be 628.95. So that might be something like that, somewhere about right there. Would you agree with that? So that's just based on a C value of 11 inches. The way that you plot a PM curve is you just pick a whole bunch of C values and just keep doing that over and over again. So when you plot that, what happens is it looks something like this. Okay. Now, 
keep in mind, the simple PM curve looks like that. So it's way underestimating. I mean, think about, think about some of these numbers. It's some pretty cool stuff. Like by itself, with no axial load, this beam can only resist about 140 foot kips in moment. But if you put some axial load on it, it can actually resist a lot more than that because that compressive force is serving to sort of negate the tension. That makes sense? So it's actually pretty slick. All right. Now, there's a couple things that we need to do to this curve to sort of fix it. The first thing, so I want you to watch this. Here's the nominal curve. And there's the cutoff curve. Now, what's the cutoff curve? I'm adjusting by this. So I'm cutting the capacity off at 0.8 alpha, or 0.8 because that's what alpha is. Okay? So I take that nominal capacity, I multiply by 0.8, and that's my cutoff. Okay? The only thing that's remaining is that. Okay? And that is adjusting the curve by the phi value. Okay? Now, if you look from here to here, see how it gets a little weird there at the end, like that little nubbin area gets a little strange? The reason why is because if you remember, how do you compute phi? Well, it goes like that, right? So when you get down here, you're getting into cases where you have really, really high moment and really, really low axial load, if you want a simple answer for what this nubbin is, that <coughs> nubbin is the transition region. You like my technical term, nubbin? That's the transition region from when it goes from 0.65 to 0.9. So it's like right here the capacity suddenly gets larger. Make sense? Now, that's great, but how do you design? See. Creating a PM curve, creating one of these for a, uh, uh, for a given beam column is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is just break out some Excel. I'm not going to make you all do that. It's not hard. I mean, if you can do what you, we've been doing this entire semester, this is, this is pretty easy. But design is actually pretty tough because in order to design, you kind of have to uh, conceptualize in your head what uh, the beam column curve would look like for any random column at any time. That's kind of tough. That's what these are for. So let me explain how these design aids work. Okay? The way these design aids work is they're a function of these two parameters here, Kn and Rn. Now, if you take a close look at these parameters, okay, you're going to see that these parameters are dimensionless. Okay, so these are dimensionless parameters. Take a look at the Kn. The bottom is a stress times an area. If you take a stress like KSI times an area in square inches, this comes out in kips, right? And on the top, Pn, that's in kips, the units cancel. Same thing over here, okay? We take the top, which is Pn times E, that's an eccentricity, so that comes out in moment. Same thing down here, the units cancel. Now, Let's take a look at these. Now, you got quite a few of these here, okay? So let's just sort of start flipping through them. Now, I've got a couple here on the screen. There's an L460.6, there's an R, there's C's. There's all sorts of stuff going on with these. And so let me see if I can remove some of the mystery behind how these curves are generated. Let's start off with the letters. Okay, do y'all notice how there's like an L and a C and an R and all y'all see that? So what do you think the C stands for? Circular columns? There we go. And so the C stands for the circular columns. What about the L and the R? Layers of steel for rectangular columns. So, so I'm glad you said that. Okay, look at the L columns and look at the R columns. Y'all see the difference? So, like right here, this is a perfect one. Like if you look at the L.9 and the R.6, see how the L has two layers of steel, but the R has three layers of steel? Do y'all see that? 
So the difference upon whether or not you would use an L chart or use an R chart. So that would be an L chart, whereas that would be something like an R chart. Does that make sense? Multiple layers of steel versus AF versus a single layer of steel. Okay. That's pretty basic. So that's what the L and the R and the, uh, the, the C refer to. Okay, now, so what about the other numbers? Well, what about the 4 and the 60? The 4 and the 60 are pretty easy. The 4 stands for 4 KSI concrete. The 60 stands for 60 KSI steel. Okay, what about the 7? Okay, or the, the point 7? Well, the point, or the 7, refers to this term gamma, and that's just the ratio between the, the, the heights of the rebar layers. So let me kind of show you what that means. So I'm just making this up. Let's say here's a column. And let's say this distance is 14 inches. And let's say this distance is 20 inches. Gamma is 14 divided by 20, which is 0.7. So that would be the chart that you would use if this was the, the column that you were detailing. If, if it was something else, you just interpolate. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. So here, here's what we're going to do. And I'll say this. Given our time frame, as much as I don't want to like make everybody come on another day if we don't have to, the facts are it's 1043 and I don't want to rush this. I'd rather meet on Wednesday. But we're not meeting in steel on Wednesday. We are going to finish in steel. Uh, but let's meet on Wednesday because I don't want to rush this. I want to give this its true day in the sun. This is a very, very simple process, but I don't want to overcomplicate it. Now, the procedure for a beam column design is pretty straightforward. The way that it works is you determine your load uh, on the column and you determine the, um, uh, excuse me, you determine this basically this theoretical uh, eccentricity and, and uh, gamma value. Based on those, Basically, all you're doing is interpolating in these charts to figure out the, the amount of steel. I don't want to rush it. I'd rather not rush it because if I do that, it's going to get uh, really complicated and I, and, I, and I don't really want to do that. Let's do this problem next time. Okay? Yes? So, um, when you mentioned interpolating the gamma value, can we not just use the next largest one? No, no, no. It, 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 that's not really what, what the charts for. The chart, so let me give you the, the, the simplest answer. So let's say, so gamma is, is a ratio of this dimension. Okay, so let's say that your gamma value was like 0.75. So what you would do is you would look up the value from a 0.7 chart, look up the value from a 0.8 chart, average them, and then use that to determine your, your steel area. However, keep in mind, that you're going to determine an area of steel required of like 5.7 square inches, and you're going to end up providing more than that anyways. You know, I mean, like what we did, what we did over here. Remember, the steel required was something like uh, was like 5.97, and we ended up rounding up anyway. Does that make sense? It's, it's going to be the same story. Instead of rushing this, though, I, I'd like to wait. I'd like to wait and do this next time. So I, I don't, I don't want to. Because it, this is very possible. I mean, I know possibly this is a topic on the exam and on your last homework, and I'd rather not bust through it. Just, just, just because, just so we can cancel class on a day where there was a good chance y'all were going to be here anyways. Let's just have class. Does that sound good? Let's have class Wednesday. Let's finish out beam columns for real. You all had a lot of really good questions on column design, and I figured that was appropriate. So let's do this on Wednesday. Let's finish out this topic for real, and then the rest of the time, Wednesday, we'll open it up to homework nine questions, and then Friday, we'll have exam questions. What do you think? Does that sound reasonable? Then that's all I've got. Um, let's not rush this, and let's do it on Wednesday. That's all i got.